some respects, these are like sketches that, oh, this was kind of a good idea. Now I'm gonna elaborate further on that on, on the next one. At the time I realized it was a lot of work, but now as I look back, I think, wow, this was an extraordinary amount of work. But I really did just so enjoy it. It might not have been overwhelming if I had mapped it out, created some kind of storyboard. I guess it's just not the, the way I enjoy working. And as a reader and reading novelists uh, say, oh, I wasn't sure what the character was going to do. And I thought, well, you're the writer. Of course you know. But you really don't. You really don't. And I think the same is, is true with this, that there's a sense of discovery. And if you've got it all mapped out, then it's kind of boring. And you're just executing as opposed mm -hmm. to creating exactly. as you go. Exactly, yeah. So the cabinet is a hexagon, and we were discussing how that mimics the honeycomb of bees. And then out from the top of this cabinet comes the paper wasp nest. And I've actually seen people quite afraid to approach it because, let's face it, wasps are sort of the villains of the insect world. So I was talking about how man tries to tame nature, so to have this almost dangerous wasp nest coming out is almost like that warning. You need to be careful with what you take on. What happens with my installation projects in which the insects are on the wall, there's a certain amount of wear and tear. And I save the parts, to, and sometimes using them as kind of transplants, <laughs> or prosthetics or cyborgs or something. I was casting a lot of beeswax figures and I think I just plopped that head on. What I like so much about that, though, is that, oddly, the cicada lady seems to have almost some sort of depth as a character because she's doing all these different things. <laughs> but you can imagine that, oh, she's taking care of this baby, but here she seems to be leading an army. <laughs> you know, I was like, wait a minute, who is this cicada lady? Wow, well, she's something... uh, every woman today. <laughs> right, exactly. There's something kind of fantastic about that. Yeah, and... that's interesting. I pulled out this drawer because it contains one of the most impressive beetles, considered maybe the largest in the world. It's in the Goliath beetle family, Goliathus orientalis. Biggest in terms of weight as opposed to, to length. Now, one of the challenges with doing the cabinet, I think, was that I had to, to take into consideration that people would be looking down on everything and so everything is from that perspective and it, and it really wasn't used used to that and the other thing too is this that for the most part we pulled out the drawers uh, all the way but typically people would not be doing that so the action had to be up near the front i used quite a few feathers which was new for me and what i love is the way the feathers hit the glass the textural things that happen and how they create this kind of jungle atmosphere. These are all marbled, hand marbled papers, sadly not done by me. Uh, most of them come from Brazil actually, but they definitely are in keeping with the 19th century feel that the cabinet has. And I like the way too the patterns mimic things, sort of seashells, rocks, strata, and things like that, things found in the natural world. I love the drawers that have this feel that the insects are going on a journey or a quest. Definitely, and that's my novel that I wrote, In Search of Goliathus Hercules, is in fact about a boy who goes on an expedition to find a mysterious insect. I love that feeling of adventure, and I think that that's definitely one of the things I tried to capture with the cabinet. For me, here in this one, I was talking about how you look down, and so it was fun for me to, to clip these twigs, and the twigs themselves are red, but then when you cut them, they show the white, and so it was a nice sort of pop of bright color. And it's kind of a denuded forest for the most part. And so when I see these little buds, they make me feel slightly hopeful. There's a reason for their journey. All is not lost. <laughs> yes. Another obsession is these mother-of-pearl buttons. I just think they are 
So beautiful. They, they are kind of floral. Are they, these are actual mother of pearl buttons. Yeah. So these are also a natural product yes. that are transformed yes, absolutely. by another series of artisans, mm -hmm. probably the late mm -hmm. 19th, early 20th century yeah. that you're then reworking. Yeah. They have to be the real deal. That actually brings up an interesting point that virtually everything is a natural material in these. That there's, can't think of any plastic. There's metals and there's a lot of stones, a lot of uh, vegetation, the feathers. To me, these are very toadstool-like, Alice in Wonderland. That was actually many of the students, um, they brought up Alice in Wonderland at various <laughs> moments that they felt mm -hmm. there was a mm -hmm. connection. And I love the way that it allows you to think about scale differently. Mm -hmm. Because if, when you see something as a button, as a human-sized person, you think about it in one size relationship to yourself. But then as you're also at the same time empathizing with this trio of bugs journeying off through this button toadstool forest, you're thinking about another set of exactly. scales yeah. And I think that tension is, um, is pretty wonderful. Yeah. And it really gets your mind jumping between those two planes. Mm -hmm. So why did you pick this drawer? It's one of my favorite because there's a lot of movement. Of course, nothing really is moving, but you've got the pattern of the paper and then these snakes that appear to be jumping out and then these, these balls that are rolling and everyone's just running, almost just like a freeze frame. And it seems too that the movement is, they're going slightly different directions. Yes. It's kind of almost an impossible moment to capture. <laughs> right, right. So these snakes, they come from Nagaland. It's kind of on the border of India and Myanmar. They're not yeah. actually snakes, but they were carved wooden hair ornaments. These drawers are filled with Various artifacts that I would have to say come from a lifetime of collecting. These are just filled with, with things that I've collected over my own travels. I feel happy. I don't feel sad to put them in an artwork. Uh, it feels like, ah, there was a purpose to this. So this one is quite intriguing because it contains Victorian era microscope slides which are just beautiful objects in and of themselves. They have a decorative, what I would describe as a decorative paper, uh, typically a kind of window and patterns around it. And these slides are actually all of insects or insect parts. And in addition to that, amongst these are some silk cocoons. I love the relationship between the silk cocoons and the threads on the various spindles that are actually propping up the microscope slides. So it seems like a wonderful way to emphasize the role of women in science in the 19th century. And it's also quite interesting too to think about the marbled paper you chose for this drawer because it almost has an effect of zooming in on something or thinking about that as something you can see through a microscope. I love the way you interpret this. <laughs> one really kind of creating this floral carpet. The fabric for these flowers I actually dyed with natural dyes. Indigo for sure, there's Osage orange, but they're all natural dyes and that was really important to me. And it's a silk velvet, so a natural fabric, and I sent it to New York to Manhattan where the last fabric flower manufacturer is. It's really a, a fantastic place for someone like me. And in many respects, these green stag beetles are a little bit camouflaged. Of course, they're a gorgeous color in and of themselves. 